ask the questions again. So, Odmar here knows a little bit more about motors than me and the average person. So we want to ask him about the Model 3 motor. Odmar, yeah. what can you tell hey. us about the Model Well, I don't actually motor. know. Okay, you so know? we can spe speculate. I don't know, but I can speculate, right? We can speculate. From what I've read, it looks like they're, they're using some sort of permanent magnet motor with uh, some sort of reluctance effect, which I think you'll see even on the Prius and on some of the others. Um, and the permanent magnet motor, let's see, how much back should we go? Basically, any synchronous motor, like a motor where the rotor turns at the same speed as the magnetic field that's going around it, mm -hmm. needs some sort of a permanent magnet or some sort of magnetism to pull with. And the that's opposed from the say an induction, induction motor. motor is induction behind. motor, there's always a slip, slip. There's always a slip, and the slip allows a difference in speed, which is a transformer action, so that there's an outer coil and an inner coil, and because of the slip, it generates current in the rotor, and that current makes the magnetic field. But that magnetic field is always slipping. It's always slipping. Because if there were no slip, there would be they no generation. Be generation. Right. Ah, so you okay, need the okay. slip to get okay. those poles. Okay. Now that might cost you 6% of your energy because you need to make that magnetic field and you, you have, have to run to current to do that. You have to generate it, right? It has to generate electricity to power the center. That's of the right. Motor. Okay, uh, now I get it. Okay. Yeah, and so there's slip there, and that's a lack of efficiency. Now, the advantage of an induction motor is that when you're running at really light load, you can adjust the slip so that you have a very low uh, magnetic field there. And so you have low back EMF and you don't have a lot of magnetic field going through your iron windings on the outside and that causes eddy current losses so on something like a unique mobility full-on permanent magnet motor going down the freeway on a single ratio vehicle with a 150 horsepower motor if you turn off all the power you still lose 1500 watts of power due to these eddy current losses because you can't reduce the strength of the magnet uh -huh. The magnet's That's always right. on, and you need the magnet designed for your peak torque. So the magnet's really strong. So the, one of the disadvantages with permanent magnet motors is they're wonderfully efficient at full power, and are at high power, yes. but at really light load, like most cars cruise down the road at maybe 10% of their full power load. And yeah. at that point, in a permanent magnet motor with a fixed ratio, if you're not shifting gears to get a more efficient point, you have these eddy current losses from the motor spinning so fast and all this magnetic field cruising through. Ah, okay. So now the real question is how can you create a magnetic field cheaply without putting energy into it all the time and yet be able to make it stronger and weaker? Variable. And variable would be nice. Yeah. So for years we've always thought the thing to do is have an induction motor that'll freewheel at no load if you're not using it. And isn't, it's very efficient, but it's not the most efficient for crews. And you could have this induction motor on one rotor, and then you'd have another right next to it, a permanent magnet motor that was just for cruise power. So you were always running at near max power. It's two motors in one case. So you could have two motors in one case, and now you'd have like a 98% efficient windings, outer windings. Ah, uh, you'd need different windings. Oh, you need because the induction motor has to slip, and the other one has to be oh, synchronous. Okay. So you need two motor controllers. It gets real complicated, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't that be ideal? Because yes. you could run your permanent magnet motor at peak efficiency all the time, drive and regen, and when you needed more horsepower or more regen, you'd fire up the induction motor and yeah, lose a few percent. But that's rare. Right, that's not your main cruise. So, as I understand it, motors like the Prius, they bury the permanent magnet a little bit deeper down into the rotor. And, um, and I don't know if they can get away with using a non-rare earth magnet, right? To just get their cruise power. And then for peak power, they manipulate timings and waveforms and probably the way they make the iron, I'm no expert on that, but I think what they're doing is something because they, they mention that they do some reluctance. And a switched reluctance motor is very different from your permanent magnet motor in the sense that it's kind of like solenoid coils around the outside and you turn them on and you pull iron toward them. And then you have another piece of iron ready on the next phase over and you turn that coil on and pulls the iron toward it. 
And so you're actually only running them one polarity. Um, you're not running this AC through it so much. And you are magnetically attracting the iron is what you're doing, right? With the current, with the magnetic field you created on the outside. Mm -hmm. So switch reluctance motors use this iron. But they have disadvantages, like because the, they're really high peak forces and very short times. They're not smooth like a synchronous motor or a, or a AC induction motor. And so because of these high peak forces and high peak currents, the casing vibrates. And so you end up with a lot of uh, acoustical noise. You can hear these motors whine and scream. And so it takes really careful design to make a good reluctance motor that's quiet, that's efficient. It's, it's and it's all in the software. It's much more, and a lot of, well, the shape of the iron is very important. Okay. Oh. And then, so I don't know, I'm, when I'm hearing magnetic and I'm hearing reluctance, and I think I've heard of them doing this on the Prius, where they bury the magnet deeper. Deeper in the armature? Deeper in the armature, mm -hmm. so that um, you can modify the magnetic field easier. You can mm -hmm. tweak it by strengthening it or there's, weakening it with the waveform around it. Well, there's some iron in front of it. So. Yeah, so they have more iron in front of it. And I don't know, so what I'm assuming is they're making this motor that cruises on these small, cheap magnets. And then for high power, they're saying, let's go reluctance. A little bit of noise when you're going high power, that's yeah. not a problem, yeah. it's right? Enjoyable, right? It's nice, we want yeah. that. Yeah. Beautiful. So, so, so the, they're probably more efficient. And that's more efficient. You know, it's great, you make that more efficient. Now your battery can be that much smaller, you know? Save a few percent on the battery side, and it's more less efficient expensive. More efficient without the rare earth thing. I don't know that for a fact, Supposedly. but I hope they could. Yeah, I would yeah. assume they could. I, yeah, I heard that they don't. Where I don't know where you're hearing it, but yeah. I haven't been reading the news in a few days, so okay. yeah, yeah, you know. So my news is from last week before the eclipse. Before the eclipse. Right now, thank you. I've had crowds since so, since before the eclipse. So yeah, the other thing that I read on one of the threads was that it's a lot more intense when it comes to the software. So you know. I would believe that. Yeah. So now there's a lot of a lot of stuff happening. I would believe that, but you know, Tesla hires some amazing people. I know someone who does work on the motor software, and that guy's a genius. So, oh, wow. you know, he's a very good coder, and, and I think they have very good mathematicians and theoreticians. They, they they just go for the best. You know, these people are brilliant. Mm. Did you did you hear about the EPA results? On the well, that's where I got this data. That's where I heard about okay. the the mag heard about the permanent magnet was. Oh, okay through the EPA Which report. Was like, was, wasn't it like getting like 400 miles or something? Or well, yeah, but that's a like some weird drive cycle, like uh -huh. 25 miles an hour or whatever. Oh, was it's it? not, I don't know the drive cycle, but it's not the EPA drive cycle. Oh, I see. Which, the one you actually rated on, I think what they do is they do a drive cycle and they, maybe they modify it, I'm guessing. It's hypermiling. But it's not, yeah, it's hypermiling. Hyper yeah. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. Still impressive, I think. We're oh yeah. For a well, unknown you, size battery that's between sixty and seventy-five, is that what? Yeah, you know, you know, I'm I'm hearing same thing you're hearing. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know. I mean, t Elon tweeted that the max they could fit was a seventy-five. Seventy-five. And maybe that's a little bigger and usable seventy-five. Who knows? Yeah. Um, so I'm guessing their largest battery is a seventy-five. And I think if you do the math, that puts a small battery somewhere in the mid fifties. Right, 50s. for the range and so on. Yeah. Um, All right. But again, I don't know. I'm speculating. You're speculating. You know, There's a whole lot it's of Model here. Three. We do a lot of speculation around that's Model right. Three. That's what's fun here, right? That's right. Well, yeah. that's more. That's smarter speculating than we can do. Something like me, you know what I mean? I'm just. I'm like, <laughs> right. what is this stuff? I but I love. It. I love learning new things. You know, when I learned about that pyro fuse in the Tesla battery, I'm like, wow, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. But speaking of the, the range. What someone ought to do, and I haven't done this, is go look at the EPA figures on a Model S, because we know the kilowatt hours on that, yeah. and we know the whole, we know the range, and see, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, because they're similar tests. Yeah, they of course this be. EPA showed the kilowatt hours, right? Wasn't it like 71 kilowatt hours for the test? Some fancy number with five decimal places on the end. Oh, I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah. So they told the battery size, right? They told the amount, but we think, oh, maybe it was over that, it was 80 something, but I think that could have been energy to recharge it. So battery energy plus the inefficiency of the charger. Yeah. And so oh, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can go backwards from that if you know the efficiency of the charger and 
Uh, or you can guess it. You can it's guess probably it. 92 to 94 for their chargers. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Right on. All right. Well, right. good stuff. That's good stuff. <laughs> All right. <laughs>And so how much more efficient are these than what we're seeing with Tesla's Powerwall? Uh, I don't know if they're necessarily more efficient, but they're significantly cheaper. Um, they're using recycled batteries, which usually cost you know, nothing or a dollar a piece or so, and they're putting them together into you know, a thousand or more cells. Um, so a Tesla Powerwall, the 14 kilowatt hour version, costs about uh, you know, over $5,000, whereas wow. the batteries that these people who I've spoken to are putting together usually cost you know, less than 1000 And how much is the normal U.S. household electricity consumption? Are we doing even less than that in terms of how much kilowatts we're getting? Uh, it's about 30 kilowatt hours per day. It's like the average you know, three-bedroom house in the U.S. Okay. Uh, so some of the Powerwall builders I spoke to, can um, have their batteries can take about 100 kilowatt hours, so you wouldn't even have to you know, collect any energy for several days if your, if your right. battery Wait, was well, stored where, all the But where are they getting these batteries from? Yeah. Um, so it's actually kind of difficult because the manufacturers don't want their laptops to be reused. And for the most part, laptops aren't like the bulk of recycling. Like a lot of you know, electronics recycling consists of um, TVs, like monitors, it's harder to get like the actual laptop batteries. So I spoke to people in Australia who were driving five, six hours in order to get these batteries. I spoke to people in California who, you know, were so driving cool. all over, you know, the southern United States in order to collect these batteries. I think now there's a community online, so they like they trade with each other and when they get a big batch they'll share and yeah. sell to each other. Um, but yeah, they're really difficult to find. And one of the videos in particular we were just showing just a moment ago was Jehu Garcia, who you interviewed for the piece about him putting it together all this. You mentioned, and look at that, that's incredible how he's able to do all that. You mentioned the companies don't want their batteries being used in this right. particular way. What do they want them being used for when they're not being used at all? <laughs> do they want them just going to the yeah. landfill? Um, so I think for them, it's a it's a liability, right? If they if they if like explodes, it's their fault. Right. I think it's important to say that uh, the people who I spoke to are incredibly skilled at doing this, and they've often been doing it for years because uh, there is a risk with any lithium ion battery of a fire. Right. Um, so I definitely, you know, I spent a long time in the piece discussing the safety concerns yeah. because they are real. You know, you, uh, one thing to note is that no one is keeping this battery inside their house. Everyone I spoke to was keeping it in a shed or was keeping it outside their home because if there is a fire. You don't want your house exploding.